We all keep hearing that adults need to have more fun. There are countless academic papers, articles, and even a few TED Talks that all validate the importance, the power, and the benefits of having more fun in our lives. Fun is this transformative force that has a biological place in our lives, just like sleep and dreams do. You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that. However, I am probably the least likely person that should be giving a talk about fun. And that's because I am a very type A, rules-oriented person. <laughs> the kind of person that has an Excel spreadsheet to organize almost every aspect of my life, from grocery store lists to vacation experiences and even romantic dates. <laughs> and these aren't just basic spreadsheets. These spreadsheets have macros and basic code built in <laughs> to create rules around my life's checklists and to-dos. I'm someone who loves rules, and I'm someone who loves structure. But when we think about fun, we think about fun without rules. Like the kind of fun kids have, you know, like unstructured creativity, unstructured spontaneity, unstructured playfulness, and a lot of laughter. In fact, there are schools designed to give adults a preschool-like experience, <laughs> where adults pay a lot of money to connect with their inner child. So my impression of someone fun is therefore not someone like me. But I'm here before you today because despite being a type A rules-oriented person, I've actually learned how to make a career out of fun. In the last 10 years, I've been working in advertising, and when I'm not working, I do improvised theater. Most people know that as improv comedy. And it's from these experiences that I want to share with you how fun and rules can coexist. So in advertising, I used to think that creativity was just this random spark of creative genius that just happens to creative people. But what I learned in advertising that I didn't know before is that creativity is actually grounded in constraint. Creativity is grounded in constraint. So let me demonstrate this. Um, let me take something as unremarkable as this rug that I'm standing on. You can't see it, but trust that there's a rug that I'm standing on, and it's not that remarkable. Um, we all know what a rug looks like. Um, and let's pretend you're all advertisers, and it's your job to say something to make someone really want this rug. Now, at first pass, you might talk about the color. It's red. Uh, you could talk about the shape. It's round. You could talk about how it might fit in someone's life. You could talk about how it feels beneath your feet. So what else can you say about this rug to make someone really want it? Oh yeah, Keep, let's make this interactive. Let's <laughs> let's hear what you have to say. Soft. Wonderful. Louder. Soft let's. Cleaning. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> oh yeah, that's it good. Looks like lava. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, those were all great responses. I probably heard over 20. There could probably be a hundred different things we could say about this rug to make someone really want it. But here's the first constraint. There can only be one message. And that's because most consumers are really good at ignoring advertising. But we have a chance at getting their attention if we have one succinct and compelling message that inspires them to want to care about this rug. So how do you go from all these messages, all these things that we could say, to finding just that one right message? Well, in advertising, we give ourselves constraints. These are considerations like, does this message differentiate against what the competition is saying? Does it meet a consumer unmet need? Does it tap into a company value? Does it tap into a larger cultural zeitgeist and consumer trend? And most importantly, does it create an emotional connection between the brand and the consumer? So these are all considerations we call constraints in advertising. And while constraints seem like the last thing you'd want to be creative, a good constraint can help remove the paralysis of choice, guide our impulses, and focus our creative process towards a compelling outcome so that this unremarkable rug beneath me can become remarkable in someone's life. The most creative people in my industry all love to play in a small box. In fact, the most 
famous madman, his name is David Ogilvy, he says, give me the freedom of a small box. Give me the freedom of a small box. When I'm not working in advertising, I'm doing improv. In improv, we call what we do spontaneous play. Because I'll get on stage with another improviser, and without a script or a preconceived idea, we will improvise and create worlds and characters we could have never imagined on our own before. I rehearse improv probably two to three times a week and perform at least once a month. In fact, my troupe is on a world tour now. Um, <laughs> uh, but when I tell people that I rehearse improv, they're like, how do you rehearse being spontaneous? How do you, how do you rehearse being playful? Well, what I learned about improv that I didn't know before is that improv is actually grounded in rules. The most famous rule, probably one that a lot of you are familiar with, is yes and. Yes means you cannot say no. You have to accept what offers you are given. And means not only do you have to accept the offer that you're given, you have to add to it. You have to build on it. And this is how two people can get on stage together and build and imagine things they could have never imagined before. So while that's an important rule, another rule that is actually much more profound for me personally is you are enough. You're enough. In other words, don't think you need to be more than the person you already are. And the reason why this rule is so profound for me personally is because I, didn't, I never thought that someone like me could be laid back enough or be cool enough or let go enough to do something like improv. But what this rule means is your experiences, your perspective, your life stories, and your vulnerabilities are what make you unique as a person. And this is the gift that you bring to an improv scene. So let me put this in context. When you're on stage and you're in the middle of an improv scene and the moment is happening right in front of you, you don't have time to invent. You only have time to pull from your own personal well of experiences to play with in that moment. In other words, you only have time to be authentically you. I love this rule so much because it means I can be both the type A person who loves serious subjects like economics, artificial intelligence, human consciousness, and neurobiology, and do improv. In fact, I remember doing a scene where my character was this super serious economist who had to deliver the most important lecture in her life about the economic impacts of artificial intelligence <laughs> while suffering from irritable bowel syndrome. <laughs> This is the yes and that I was talking about earlier. I brought in my geeky passion for economics, and my partner brought in his geeky passion for digestive system mechanics. <laughs> and together, we created a scene about a very serious, serious character but with an unfortunate ailment. So yes and, you're enough, and other rules like it are the rules that I rehearse over and over and over again to enable myself to play. Traditionally, we think that rules put limitations on our fun. But in my experience, rules have helped to set me free. A lot of the examples I gave you from my experience are examples of what I call productive fun, meaning fun where there's an outcome. I believe this also applies to leisure fun, which for me means fun where there's no outcome. So for example, let's take a baseball game. If you're playing the baseball game, there are obviously rules that you have to abide by. If you're watching the baseball game, there are also rules that govern even that experience. When your home team hits a home run, you cheer. When your opposing team hits a home run, you boo. And when we get to the seventh inning stretch, everyone gets up and sings, take me out to the ball game together. And even if you're not actively engaged in watching the game, because let's all admit baseball can be pretty boring, um, there are rules that govern even your interaction with your friends and your etiquette at the stadium. So at this point, you're probably like, mm, I don't know, this sounds wrong. <laughs> We're told that there should be no rules in fun. In fact, adults are told they should have unstructured fun, like the way kids do. Um, but that's not actually possible. Here's why. So this is an fMRI scan of a brain, because it wouldn't be a TED Talk without an image of a brain. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but what you see here is the difference between a child's brain and an adult's brain. In an adult brain, the prefrontal cortex is so much more developed than it is in the child's brain. That's the area colored in blue. This is the part of the brain that's responsible for all of our cognitive functions, namely planning, uh, our impulses to control, and self-monitor. In other words, this is the part of the brain that needs rules and patterns. And the older we get, the more advanced our brains get at recognizing rules and patterns. So unless we regress the advancement of our brains, it's not actually possible for adults to play like kids. Adults are really good at identifying rules, playing within rules, breaking those rules, and then creating new rules altogether. So maybe the question we should ask ourselves shouldn't be, how can adults have more fun like kids? Maybe the question we should ask ourselves is, how can adults have more fun like adults? Well, what does adult fun look like? And I don't mean the X-rated kind, because I heard someone snicker. <laughs> <laughs> there, <laughs> there's a theory in positive psychology called flow. Flow describes a mental state that you guys are all familiar with. It's when you are so absorbed and immersed in an activity that you lose all sense of time, you forget to eat, you even forget to go to the bathroom. And that's because when you're in flow, the feeling you get is that of spontaneous joy, even rapture. I love the way that Buddhists and Taoists describe flow, which is the sense of doing without doing, this out of body and transcendent experience but from being so engaged in an activity. So what can we learn from flow that we can apply to fun? Because the same feeling of spontaneous joy we get from flow is also the same feeling we get from fun. To achieve flow, there are seven conditions that we need to meet. Knowing what to do, knowing how to do it, knowing how well you are doing, knowing where to go, because if navigation is involved, you should know where to go. High perceived challenges, because it can't be too boring, otherwise you'll uh, lose interest. High perceived skills and a freedom from distraction. What jumps out at me is that four out of seven of these conditions describe someone with highly refined skills. In other words, an expert. So what this tells me is that to achieve flow or that feeling of spontaneous joy in an activity that you're engaged in, you have to know the rules because that's what being an expert means after all. And the cool part is when you scan the brains of expert improviser types like jazz musicians or uh, hip hop artists, when they're in this state of spontaneous flow, when they're in this state of spontaneous creativity, the part of the brain that lights up with activity, it's what's called the medial prefrontal cortex. That's a mouthful, so for simplicity, let's call this part of the brain the free thinker. The part of the brain that lowers an activity is called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain that needs rules and patterns. So for simplicity, let's call this the rule seeker. So what's really cool is that in my experience, you can achieve flow and that spontaneous feeling of joy in the free thinker when you shut down the rule seeker. And you can shut down the rule seeker by giving it the rules that it's looking for. This is why I rehearse improv. By being an expert in playing within its rules over and over again, I can transcend them and achieve that out-of-body experience of doing without doing. I feed my rule seeker rules like you're enough and yes and, and I give my creativity constraint so that I shut down this part of the brain and set my free thinker free to spontaneously create and play and have fun. And when that happens, your brain releases a flood of serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins, all the chemicals and chemical transmitters that make you feel happy and joyful. So our brain needs rules because rules help to set us free. The final thing I want to say about why we need rules and fun is because it helps to create trust. Well, why do we need trust and fun? If there's one thing that stands out in my experience with new improvisers is that there's a fear of looking stupid or a fear of saying something dumb, a fear of actually being vulnerable. But this is where rules can get everyone on the same page. In advertising, we tell ourselves, fail often. In improv, we tell ourselves, look foolish. Because if we can all get on the same page and understand what those rules are and, and agree to them together, agree that we're all going to fail often, and agree that we're all going to look foolish, then we trust 
that we're safe to freely create, freely play, and freely have fun. Rules create trust. I used to think that fun was just something that happens. You know, something random that just happens. You go to a party and it's fun. You go to another party and it's not so fun. But you have the power to make fun happen. In fact, you have the power to be really good at it. So I invite you all to look at an activity that's fun for you, identify the rules within the activity that make it fun for you, and then embrace them hard and with enthusiasm over and over and over again and see if you discover something new about yourself. And then break them. Break those rules and create new rules that make that activity even more fun for you. In other words, I invite you all to take a type A person's approach <laughs> to fun and letting rules set you free rather than limit you in your journey towards rediscovering what fun can mean for you. Because just like there are laws that govern physics and just like there are uh, ecosystems that structure nature and grammar that creates sentences, there are also rules in fun. And just like the laws of physics have created the northern lights and iambic pentameter has given Shakespeare its beat, rules can also lead to magical moments of fun. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.